my name is Hyatt Mamoon and I'm a wildlife filmmaker and presenter. And today I'm with Red Series Behind the Look, hosting a Q&A with the incredible team behind PBS Nature's newest installment, The Hummingbird Effect. This documentary highlights the massive influence that these tiny creatures have on Costa Rica's super diverse ecosystem. In Costa Rica, the national motto is Pura Vida, Pure Life. And here, life is everywhere. Over half a million species make this small country a biodiversity giant. And it's thanks, in part, to one tiny creature. The hummingbird. Hummingbirds are the impossible incarnate, masters of miraculous flight, cloaked in otherworldly colors. A glimmer in the green, and they're gone. But their effect lingers, bringing flowers to the fields and fruit to the forest, where a whole community of creatures enjoys the hummingbird effect. That is absolutely gorgeous, and I am so excited to learn more about how y'all got all of that. Joining us today, we have the filmmakers, Philippe D'Andrade, and from Brian Magari and Doug Schultz. Thank y'all for being here today. So to kick things off, can you tell me a little more about yourselves and the film? Sure, my name's Ann Prum, as you can see, and I'm a wildlife filmmaker, and I specialize throughout my career on all kinds of different animals, but I do a lot of films about birds, and this is just another in that long lineup. I'm really excited about to be here today and share the making of this film with you all. Uh, I'm Doug Schultz. I'm a producer, director, writer, uh, and um, yeah, thanks for having us. Hey, I'm Brian Magari. I'm a wildlife cinematographer based in Costa Rica. What's going on? My name is Felipe Andrade. I'm a National Geographic explorer, conservationist, filmmaker, and all-around wildlife enthusiast. So I'm jumping straight into it. I know this film is about the hummingbird effect, kind of a play on the butterfly effect. So if you follow the food chain, dozens of species depend on hummingbirds. Could you expand on that? Um, and uh, when she called me and she said she was uh, about to embark on this film about hummingbirds and wanted to include, make it a bigger ecosystem story about uh, the role that hummingbirds play in the ecosystem. So we, uh, set out to just capture all the animals that depend on pollination. And that includes almost everything that you find in the forest and all these different micro environments that exist in Costa Rica, from the top of the mountains down to the lowland forest. So we have uh, different species of monkeys, plenty of other birds that eat fruit, um, and a lot of mammals, interesting mammals that live on the forest floor that eat fallen fruit and scraps of fruit. And um, it's incredible that this tiny, tiny animal has such a huge effect on all of the animals uh, of Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah and one sure. of the, oh, sorry, I had to cut you off. Were you gonna say? No, just quickly, I was gonna say, one of the amazing things about hummingbirds is a lot like in biology, but also in terms of film and conservation and just purely being a wildlife enthusiast, hummingbirds are like a gateway drug. You know, it's like, hey, like follow me over here and I'm gonna show you this like watercolor dashing through the sky. And then once, once you take a hit of that, it, it courses through your veins and it only gets you excited about what else is around the corner, about some of the honestly like psychedelic experiences that you can have with these tiny creatures because there's so much more than meets the eye when it comes to hummingbirds. They are beautiful, they're pollinators and we tend to think of pollinators as like delicate creatures, you know, like butterflies, but really they're avian ninjas. So when you get drawn into hummingbirds, it really shows you the majesty of nature around them that they in particular are largely responsible for as pollinators. So hummingbirds are great source, you know, great subject for a film. But also if you're somebody watching this and you want to get involved in nature, you want to take a naturalist led trip, hummingbirds are a great place to start because they'll show you the natural world, what they're responsible for, and then that will take you to other experiences. I love that hummingbirds are a gateway drug. <laughs> I'm sure getting up close and personal with these tiny, beautifully delicate little creatures must have been difficult. How are you able to like get these shots? 
Well, hummingbirds are, you know, nectar eaters. So you always, you just want to go to the places where there are a lot of flowers. That is, you know, they are drawn to that. And throughout Costa Rica, there are, well, you know, places that are known as hotspots for hummingbirds. So either from the high volcanoes all the way down to the lowlands. But their real pressure point for hummingbirds is in the cloud forest, in that sort of, you know, misty, mossy uh, ecosystem. And that's where there's the most diversity of hummingbirds and because there's so many flowers there for them. So we would we worked a lot with local Costa Rican bird guides and natural history guides to help us find the best, these hotspots. Uh, Costa Rica is an ecotourism uh, mecca. And because of that, there are a lot of people who make their livings just showing people where to find animals and, and hummingbirds. So that made our jobs in a limited amount of time that we had to, to turn this film around, made our jobs a lot easier. Definitely. And anything else you want to add? Uh, I, would just say, I was very impressed. I, as I said, I had never been to Costa Rica before. I know that it's a big um, ecotourism destination but it's very easy to get away from the tourist pack and into the wild in a way that uh, I hadn't expected. And these guides that we worked with, um, these naturalists and guides, there's this whole generation now in Costa Rica of young nature guides uh, who, as Anne said, are making their living this way. And I found it very inspiring to see that there can be a movement basically to uh, encourage young people to appreciate the environment that they have. And Costa Rica is very lucky considering, you know, what's happened to the environment in a lot of the surrounding countries. Um, and so it was great to be able to interact with them and to see that in action, that they, they really genuinely care about uh, the animals, the environment, and a lot of them are budding photographers themselves. So it was really a pleasure to meet all of them and work with them on this project. And I think they had a great time too. So it was really a pleasure. One of the things about hummingbirds as well is like in a lot of folklore and a lot of stories, you know, authors, artists, they make hummingbirds out to be the messengers of the forest. And it sounds a little like cheeky and maybe corny even, but when you're out in nature, it's absolutely true. Like you can hear a hummingbird, whether it's whipping by at 60 miles an hour in flight or just buzzing from flower to flower, you know, or even fighting or kind of like staking out their territory. If you're lucky enough to see one, it's an uh, amazing experience. But just hearing it, you kind of start to follow the trail a little bit. And even getting like back to like the conception a little bit of like this story, you know, for us that came to Costa Rica, fell in love with it, you know, for me personally, again, it was the hummingbird that brought me here. But the hummingbird led me to jaguars. It led me to like meeting incredible people. It allowed me to work with Anne, who... And inspired me to get into this in the first place. You know, I saw her film uh, in 2012 while I was at University of Florida wanting to make a career out of wildlife filmmaking. And then I saw my first hummingbird on the Appalachian Trail a couple months later and just hearing it for the first time, but only having ever seen it in video, the message to me was loud and clear. It was like, whatever you got to do to surround yourself around these animals, figure it out. Because the cool thing about hummingbirds is they live in beautiful places. As Anne just mentioned, they're at high altitude cloud forests, they're in rainforests, they're in dry forests, they're along the coast. You can either even see them flying over the ocean when they make a 500 mile migration across the Gulf of Mexico. Hummingbirds are incredible and they'll take you to incredible places as long as you're willing to receive the message. And you were mentioning like how beautiful they are and how magical they can be. And I've had that experience with hummingbirds even all the way out in Colorado. And this one clip really comes to mind when you're talking about that magic. I just want to show you this clip from the film about the coloring on the female white neck Jacobin. It's a perfect example of how up close and personal y'all got with these hummingbirds. So let's play it once for our audience and then I'm going to play it again. And when you guys were shooting the sequence, Anne came back by herself when the team realized the potential of the story. So Anne, could you walk a, uh, walk us through it as we watch it again? Sure. Sweet, so let's go ahead and play it. A male white-necked Jacobin takes a break from feeding to rest and digest. But there's no rest for these guys. White-necked Jacobins are notorious bullies. Aggressive and territorial around any food source. 
They're always ready for a brawl. Their metallic blue tuxedos and flared white skirts distinguish them from females who sport a less glitzy green. This vast difference in coloration makes females a target for constant harassment. It's almost impossible to feed in peace. But some females have found a clever solution. And a few of these males have a secret. At birth, all white neck Jacobins are born with male coloring. As females mature, they shed their vivid colors for a more muted palette. But one out of every five females holds on to their male costume, keeping their bright blue coloring into adulthood. The disguise lets her slip through the crowd unnoticed. And at a feeding flower, she can linger as long as she likes. It's called deceptive coloration, and we're just discovering it may be more common than we think. And it's why for this female, life is no longer a drag. So this is the uh, white neck Jacobin. It's a very elegant hummingbird. Looks like it's dressed up in a little hummingbird tuxedo. Uh, and we had read an article that had been recently published about this hummingbird that a lot of the females that are normally drably colored, you'll see them a little bit later in the scene, have retained the male plumage. When they're born, they're all they're all in male plumage. And so the females will molt out of that male plumage later in life. But here, these females are using the male plumage to basically as an anti-harassment. Here's a female, that's a female colored uh, Jacobin. And you see, she's just, you know, greenish with some spots, a little drab, but they get, females get harassed a lot by the males, not only for mating, but also around feeding flowers. So these females who have evolved to look like males get a lot less harassment. And it's, you know, kind of a fascinating thing. It's been found in other hummingbirds as well, but it had not as well documented as it was in the Jacobins. So once we were at a, a site, we filmed this at a place called Rancho Naturalista. Uh, once we found that sort of Jacobin hotspot, uh, it rained a lot, as you can see. And then I went back and just did a few more pickups during the edit because uh, as Doug was writing it, he was like, this story is fantastic. It's gonna give us a lot of screen time. We just need a little bit more uh, footage to cover all that, what we wanna say. But you can see they're super cooperative um, <laughs> and you know, in a frenzy, it's a frenzy of hummingbirds. And the funny thing is too, it's that there are very few other species at the site um they seem to drive off all the other hummingbirds so it's like jacobin central and that's pretty rare too that you would find a place where there's flowers and hummingbirds and you just have one species that dominates the challenge with them too is that they're so white uh you know the contrast range is 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 difficult when that little white skirt gets flashed they're using it as a as a show of dominance obviously that's why you know it, it flashes so brightly white but that was always a you know a difficult dynamic range issue for us well these wides are really what's standing out to me where the butter or the butterfly oh my gosh sorry the hummingbird flies right up really close like right smack in the middle that just stands out to me and i'm wondering like did you have some sort of flower camera trap like how did you guys get these hummingbirds to get so close yeah well the hummingbirds will come in hummingbirds are great to work with because they are somewhat trainable uh they come to feeders 
right? So um, we had these little these little little feeders that we could put in, you know, places near our cameras. And yeah, uh, you're hanging from your camera or like, how did you, what is the setup I there? Mounted on rails. Oh, sweet. Are mounted on rails. And uh, yeah, we had a gazillion of those little feeders. I think Phil, you were like, give me, get, bring me like a hundred of those little feeders. And we have so many of those little feeders. They're just like dollar sized, uh, silver so dollars. have flower camera traps. No. That is so funny. So this is a question for everyone. What's the most rare shot in this film? Like, were there any firsts? Because I feel like those, those have to be firsts. Mm. Pickle Bill Ness, maybe? Pickle Bill Ness, for sure. Sickle Ooh, Bill Nest really is definitely that. a first. Uh, that was super, you know, elusive thing to get. I think I would say that is the first. Even the volcano, any of the nesting, I think all the, the nests are probably first. Um, not the rufous tail, but yeah, I'd say about five of those nests in the show are firsts. Wow. So, I mean, you mentioned the sickle bill. I actually want to transition into showing our audience this next clip. I've never seen anything like this. I've seen some pretty wacky beaks like spoon bills, but I've never seen anything like this. So let's go through it the same way we did the last one where we play it once for everyone to watch. And then Philippe, do you want to go over this or do you want to, do you want to discuss this one as we watch it? Let's do it. Let's roll. All right, let's go ahead and play the clip. In the humid foothills of the Central Highlands, an unusual plant hangs in the understory. The bright red segments and yellow flowers of Heliconia remonensis send a signal. The plant wants to have sex, but it needs help. It can't move to meet up with a mate so it advertises for a go-between. And not just anyone will fit the bill. It offers a sugary reward locked in sharply angled blossoms. And to access it takes a special key. A green-crowned brilliant considers an approach. There must be some way to get to that nectar. The nectar tube is too deep, not worth the effort. A green hermit might have a better shot. With a curved beak and a bandit's mask, surely she can steal some nectar from a stingy plant. She uses her long body and tail feathers to propel herself forward. Maybe she can force her way in. Still a lot of effort for a little taste. It's almost as though to get in there, you would need a 90 degree angled beak. A white tipped sickle bill stops in. No surprise, it's a perfect fit. Sickle bills have evolved to specialize in these peculiar flowers. And the plants have developed corollas tailor-made for these sharply curved bills. Most hummingbirds hover while feeding, but the sickle bill perches using her left foot to pry open the flower. So the sickle bill is, I mean, there's no, like, there's no more basic way to put it. It's an absolute challenge. And it's kind of funny because a lot of the people in the area call it uh, un abre impossible, like the impossible bird. So it's super difficult to see, let alone film. And as you can see from this species of Heliconia, it's got that flower that kind of drapes down and creates a very unique shape. So that is an absolute dinner bell for the white tip sickle bill. 
this bird primarily feeds on one flower and this one flower primarily gets pollinated by this one bird. So it's a beautiful love story and both are necessary partners in co-evolution. And again, getting back to the challenge aspect, I mean, I once went six weeks without showering when I lived in the woods just to win a 12 pack of PBR. How that's relevant, it's not. But you're talking to a bunch of stinky filmmakers, so you're going to have to hear those stories. I'm sorry about it. So getting back to the beautiful aspect of filmmaking, this white tip sickle bill would only come around once every like hour to hour and 20 minutes. And I didn't know exactly how long it was taking. So what I actually started doing was taking screenshots of the time on my phone, and then I would write the time down on the notes app. So I have about like close to two weeks of my life dedicated to filming just this one bird between getting it at the feeder and then getting it at the, or getting it on the flower and then getting it at the nest. So in this shot, you can see the hermit coming in. He's trying to feed. It's almost the right size, but not quite. And then later on, you'll see the white tip sickle bill come in. But why the timing and why like logging the behavior was important was because it allowed me to anticipate the behavior of the bird. And that's an incredible lesson for any like budding or, or aspiring filmmakers to pick up on is you want to pick up, you want to anticipate behavior. You don't want to react to it because if you can anticipate it, then you're going to cover the behavior from beginning to end. So as you can see, the sickle bill coming in, positioning its head just to pull the bottom pedal down and then stick it in there. And you can see that like little hat that it's got on. It's got a, almost like a little bald spot or like it's rocking a yellow yarmulke, if you will. And that yarmulke is all pollen, that yellow tip on the top of its head. That's that's just a collection of pollen, which means that it's going to feed. It's going to go and feed on another flower. And it's going to literally breathe life into every single thing that it's touching. So it's not only beautiful. It's not only rare. It's not only unique. It's also criti critically important. So the per the per um, the preservation of this flower is critical to preserving this bird. In preserving this bird, you preserve this flower. So it's a unique story to tell because it's incredibly challenging to get, but again, it's also extremely important. And then later on, we were able to get a nesting scene. I had one of the local guides hit me up and he was like, dude, I found a nest. It's over in river. It's in a super rare, like difficult to get to spot. Let's go. So then I went and I spent another week over there getting the bird, nesting, coming back, feeding. And again, all together, it was about two weeks of my life spent with this bird, but it was incredibly worth it because sometimes in filmmaking, you get to get the shot, but what you're left with is the experience, the moments, and that's what changes you. That's what creates that spark to keep going is to get more of those delicious life moments, if you will. So did these birds, you know, if these birds evolved at the same time as this plant? Like they evolved for each other? Yes, they did. Wow. There's, I mean, yeah, you can see you... with a lot of species, not just of hummingbirds, but other, other pollinators as well, where a flower and its pollinator will evolve in tandem. And so some of them have very long bills, uh, you know, in, um, uh, in South America, they have sword bills where the bills are really long and there's these particular red flowers that have a tube about this long um, that you can't imagine what could possibly pollinate it. And then it's just a perfect fit, like a glove. This one happens to be very extreme because of this angle. Um, but yeah, it's one of the best examples. It actually was perfect for us because we did not expect to get this mm -hmm. bird because they're so difficult to find and very skittish. Um, and it was actually the first shoot that we were all on together when we got to this spot. And, all, and started filming this. And it's the perfect way to introduce that idea of co-evolution and also just the sort of ABCs of pollination for people who don't understand how a bird can help plants have sex, which is basically what they're doing. So. Well, um, yeah, and I think it's important to say, you know, evolution's hap this has happened over, you know, tens of millions of years. So this bird didn't look like this tens of millions of years ago, nor did the plant, but they've driven each other to this extreme over, you know, millions of years it's hard for us to get our brains around that time scale but you know 10 million years ago the sickle bill didn't look like a, the sickle bill we have today right nor did the heliconia look like it looked like so they've been they've been driving each other and what it does is just make sure that that pollinator is totally faithful to that plant right yeah. that 
that sickle bill is not going to go someplace else. It's like, I've got you. Uh, other hummingbirds that just have straight bills, you know, in the they can feed on anything. They're generalists. So they are not specific. But this kind of system, it's once it starts, it's like it just keeps going and going and going. You get these extremes. So the sickle yeah. bill can't feed on any other flower. It can feed, but it's not as successful, right? Yeah, because it probably has to go in like upside yeah. down, kind of. <laughs> you know, it's heavy. You can see on this, on that little uh, heliconia, it would it, grab it with its foot, you know. And yeah, yeah, where it grabs and opens it. down. And uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Anthony who works there, he would go out every morning and actually look for feet marks on the heliconia, like little scrape marks that were fresh. Oh, and that's how he marks. knew it was feeding. If he wasn't there to see it, he would see this what was left behind of this little scraped foot mark of the other, the foot that's holding would make this little scrape mark. So, you know, that's pretty amazing detail of his life, but uh, also helped us because we didn't know that we were going to find, as Doug said and, and Philippe said, we didn't know we were going to find this bird. And we stopped at this uh, site, this hu known hummingbird site, thinking we were going to just film hummingbirds, general hummingbirds that were showing up there. And Anthony said, hey, I have a sickle bill here. It's been coming by. Right. Like, Drop everything. <laughs> wow. Well, and so I wonder if they're like, they're left or right Footed. Do I, I wonder if they like prefer one or the other to pull it open. Yes, they always use their left foot to open the blossom. No way. Yeah, they're left footed. Weird. I don't know why. Yeah, they're left footed. And what you can see that like cool? you can see you go out and you, they leave these scars on the from their perching foot on the red part of the flower. So you can see where they've been feeding. Or pull it open. That is so funny. I didn't expect yeah. actually like for them to be left or right handed or footed per se. Yeah. Like us. <laughs> So, so I'm guess I'm assuming I'm, I know this takes a lot of time and patience goes into this. How long did this film take you guys to shoot? Um, well, we started in September and we were pretty, yeah, pretty much over a course of a year. We we're obviously not shooting every day, um, but over the course of the, of the year to get different seasonal variation. And, and there are two different seasons, right? Because I know in the South you get you get the wet season and the dry season. The wet season and the dry season, and then in in Costa Rica, of course, it's altitudinal difference, right? You can go up the mountain and wow. get things that are happening at the top versus at the bottom. So our the you know the thing that we had to wait the that was sort of the bottleneck for us was nesting, hummingbird nesting, which was in the fall, our fall. So you know that was sort of the last our last gasp of like, oh my gosh, we got to get a lot of nests because few people, our audiences love nests and the hummingbird is so tiny and it makes such a tiny little perfect cup uh, that it always leaves people just like, oh my God, how did that tiny little bird weave such a beautiful, perfect home for its, for its babies? So would you see them building a nest and then like, okay, park the camera here? Yeah, but we did a couple things. Uh, Philippe put out an APB on Nest to all his friends. Uh, and then we also brought down uh, a fellow that we've worked with in the past named Harold Greeny, who is basically the world's best humming nest finder of anything. He's described probably 2,000 nests uh, that have never been, never, never known before. So I knew that when the clock was ticking, I was like, Harold, you need to come down and help us find some nests. And they're tiny, right? These are things that are just like an egg, half an egg size. You know, if you cracked it's an egg, so big, like, would you put say it, it in the forest and they're camouflaged. But Harold has this great ability. Like when we see a bird fly, we all follow it with our eyes. What Harold does is he goes back to where the bird came from. And he just does that over and over and over again. And he basically follows his way back to a nest. And he was with us for probably five days and he found probably 15 nests. How do you follow a hummingbird? They move so fast. <laughs> well, a lot of times, I mean, it, it, this is something you just kind of like, and I mean, Hyatt, I know you're asking these questions when you already know the answer to them, but just queuing it up for people that don't know, which is sweet <laughs> of you. Um, Cause Hyatt herself, it's worth mentioning is an exceptional filmmaker and storyteller as well. Uh, so but um, to, to, to get back to that question, you really have to like, you, you think about what you have as a tool set, right? And then you think about what wildlife has as a, as a tool set. So to answer this question, not just relative to the hummingbirds, but to all wildlife in general, 
wild animals are so much better equipped. They have so many more tools in their arsenal than we do to navigate, to get around. You know, their sense of everything is incredibly better than ours. So a lot of times when you see like people that are trying to get into wildlife filmmaking or photography, they're only using their eyes, but you really have to listen. So when you hear a hummingbird fly by, again, some birds can fly up to 60 miles an hour. So it's just a zip. So like Ann just mentioned, rather than seeing where it's going, you have to follow where it's coming from. But also if you're going through a walk in the woods, you're trying to listen the entire time because a lot of animals, they'll tell you where they are without ever having seen them. So you really wanna open up your ears. A lot of times I hear people like hiking through the woods, talking or listening to music. You're gonna miss 90% of what you could potentially capture if you're not 100% plugged in feet to the ground, ears to the ground, and just listening, smelling. A lot of times, like when I'm going for night hikes and I'm looking for animals, it's when I stop to use the bathroom that I actually find what I'm looking for because it's the most amount of time that I'll actually just stop, be, and listen. So again, that's a note. If anybody's looking to get into this, go out there without music, without conversation, and just be completely immersed. And more often than not, you're going to hear the animal before you're going to see it. I think so, you're telling everybody just to take a pee in the woods, aren't you, Phil? <laughs> also to squat in the woods. That It's not only better for your you know, track, but it's also better for finding animals. Just make <laughs> sure to pack it out. You know, it's so funny that you mentioned smelling to it in this conversation. I used to, um, so I actually shot a film about Mustangs in the West. And we were looking around, we were in Arizona, we couldn't find the Mustangs but we could find their poop by smelling them. <laughs> but so I have this question. That's how Brian and I find each other in the woods all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the hummingbirds I'm used to, they make this kind of whistling sound with their wings where it's like, sounds like a little like going away. Do they make the same sound? More like a vibration sound? Yeah, like it's like a little, or like almost like a whistle that just like shoots right by. Yeah. Oh. So where, where do you live? Where do you live, Hyatt? So I live currently in Miami, but I spend a lot of time in Colorado with my parents. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the, you know, different hummingbirds have all different wing shapes and tail shapes, and they make some of them sound like they have like a loose, you know, uh, change in their pockets. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably Anna's has that loose change kind of sound. Yeah. It has, uh, it's like a very soothing sound to me. Yeah. 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 So they each have different, and they, different chirps too. So you can identify you know, who's flying by once you start to identify, oh yeah, that loose change sound, that's that one. <laughs> another way to identify them. Well, this is another question I have. How would you know where they're going to land? And you were saying, you know, where we're coming from. How do you know where they were going to set up on this like stick and to see, okay, they're going to go right smack in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, they get sort of landing pads, just like any bird will come to a place where they can kind of observe the scene, right? Just like, oh, this is the good one. If I'm here and they'll battle over those too. Um, if it's near, you know, a hot spot of feeding, whether with a feeder or with flowers, they want to sort of be above, you know, the other ones. So we, you know, you can pretty quickly learn where those spots are. And, and yeah, there's a lot of watching for patterns, you know, you just, once you see it happen twice, then you get fixed in on that spot. Cause you know, that bird is going to land there again. And then once you get it, then you watch where they go next. So there's a lot of that. Waiting so you see, around like, this and... stick is the place to be. I'm gonna go be on that stick. That looks like the hottest hummingbird spot. Yeah, where I can. Like people, like, yeah. You know, I remember talking to a hummingbird biologist, and he was, you know, basically like if hummingbirds could talk, they'd be throwing f bombs everywhere, right? So they're they're supercharged. They're hyped up on sugar. They're aggressive. Everyone thinks of them as delicate and beautiful, but they're they're not. They just love to fight. They, I, they, I think they enjoy it. You know, they'll they like fighting something. over the feeder all the time. Yeah, and they can do so much with their wings that it, you know, it's got to be just play for them. So, uh, you know, they want to be in that position where they can, you know, dive in and cause some trouble the easiest they can. <laughs> I relate. So, what's my my next question is, what was your biggest challenge? Brian, you got to answer this one. <laughs> I, guess I, I had a very small small uh part to do with this but um for me the biggest challenge 
he had to road trip know. with me so no, no, <laughs> we, honestly the biggest challenge i thought was when we were doing some of the uh, most controlled time lapse stuff in the mangroves for whatever reason yeah. the, the the tide was was very it was, it was very odd um you know usually you know tide goes out about six hours later it comes back in but we were waiting out there for at, at least six hours and it just didn't start it didn't come in until the last like hour up until high tide it's just all at one time everything just rushed in it's um, just go 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 now yeah it was just like a go 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 thing um but, but yeah that and then bringing all that camera gear on pretty much little kayaks going out into the mangrove um and I did a scout before we went out there and at low tide, I don't know if you've been in a mangrove before, but you just, Miami, like, it's, like a, it's like quicksand, right? Like, so you're just in thigh deep water or I'm sorry, thigh deep mud and like pull, pulling your leg out. And it's like a suction cup stuck into the yeah. ground. Yep. Um, so getting to some of the locations definitely took a little bit of, a uh, little bit of extra work. Huh. <laughs> Uh, kayaking and then climbing over re basically what feels like rebar these big all those mangrove roots and things brian yeah, was putting you know, launching a, a camera on dollies under the mangroves and then launching the drone and we were kayaking waiting for the tide to come back in which didn't come for some reason <laughs> um, it eventually did and then it escaping the rain at the end of the day <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. i get that the go 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 moments whenever you know you're sitting there all day and then suddenly it's happening. Everybody panics, but you have to stay like mentally ready. Like this is the moment we're going to do it now. Everybody move quickly. I had a shoot recently in the dry Tortugas um, where it started raining as we were filming uh, some turtles being released. And it was just go, 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 go now. And luckily my cinematographer, she kept her camera running. And that was such an important part. But just that go, go, go moment. That's the that's the epitome of wildlife filmmaking. Yeah, it really everybody is. Says, everybody says F8 and be there, but the being there, that's the that's the hard part. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is just like getting to location is is harder than actually getting the shot a lot oh, of yeah. times. For sure. That's a, just like going back to that shoot with the Mustangs. We were in the desert and we had to walk for so many miles in the heat and it wasn't even really sand. It was more like dust. So just getting there to get the shot is huge. And I'm sure a lot of research and prep went into this, knowing where to go. Um, how did this team come to be? How did how did you guys meet up and say, okay, this is it, this is the team, let's prepare for this, let's go? Yeah, um, well, I can start that. Um, I was trying to pitch a series or a story about Costa Rica um, wanting to get away as this post COVID things are just starting to open up. And I knew my husband and I were going to move there for four months and I was trying to get a film lined up and I had some irons in the fire, but nothing for sure when I landed in Costa Rica. But then shortly thereafter, like two days after I landed, Fred Kaufman of Nature called me and said, I would love a story in Costa Rica. What do you got? And, and I started talking about some things He's like, let's just do a hummingbird show. Um because we had done two hummingbird shows previously and his viewers really enjoy them. So that made perfect sense. And then I thought, well, let's do something different, right? Not just a typical hummingbird show. So this is, let's make it the hummingbird effect, how the hummingbirds affect an ecosystem. And then I called Doug, who I've known for years. Uh, and I was like, Doug, we need to quickly write up a proposal pitch for this made up idea I had. I think I'd read a paper recently about, but you know, something to this effect, but what could we really do it? And then, of course, Philippe and Brian live in Costa Rica, and I had been in touch with Philippe in months leading up to this, and I knew that they would be, you know, hands on deck, ready to go, know a lot of places, know a lot of people, know great areas for everything from scenics to drones to, uh, you know, where to get beautiful scarlet macaw shots, things like that, that were just invaluable. So pretty quickly, we got, you know, it doesn't take much if you have people who know what they're doing and they're dedicated to it. And uh, it was just great that Brian and Phil Philippe lived there. I mean, that made, uh, and that I was living there temporarily, that that made the production, you know, run super smoothly. And we could spend a lot of days in the field without having to be flying in, flying out. You know, we could use our time on the ground really efficiently. And of course, you work really closely with local production, I'm sure, and folks living in the area to get to know the hidden secrets. Yeah, they uh, were key. <laughs> somebody yeah, else? Yeah. 
Yeah, even <laughs> though when we were doing some of the scenic shots, um, Doug and I went to a spot. Um, just we, we, I, we, I had heard of this one waterfall. We went there, filmed it, a couple of different um, shots through the forest, and then one of the guys was like, "We got another one across the street," and so we. <laughs> Walked over and did a little hike, a little 30 minute hike, got to another beautiful waterfall with, with just like this bluish, like very bright blue water coming down throughout. And then filmed that. And he's like, there's another one if you want. <laughs> and everything was just so close, um, like different filming locations, especially for from like a scenic aspect. Um, there was just, there's just so much in Costa Rica. Not only is there a bunch of wildlife, but there's, there's just, location after location after location that looks completely different but equally as beautiful just across the country whether you're in lowlands highlands the caribbean wherever yeah yeah i think that's the real surprise for people it's just how incredibly diverse it is habitat wise mm -hmm. and then you have hummingbirds in each one of those habitats and that's that's really fun and their effect is really different throughout so that's and the culture, the culture here, I mean, you think about like what Doug was mentioning earlier about this kind of like new generation of conservationist photographers, filmmakers, like they are so, like, I'm Brazilian, right? We do booty lifts and soccer. That's, that's, that's about it. Uh, there's a couple of other things we do well, but we do those two things particularly well. So when you think about what Costa Rica does well, it does the culture of conservation, the culture of wildlife, the culture of ecotourism. This is a country that for a lot of years, it was going in the opposite direction up until about the 70s. It was, you know, leading the way in deforestation. And then in the 70s, they really started in the 60s, 70s, they really started turning it around. And at one point, it was the fastest regenerate, regenerated and reforested countries at a rate on the planet. So they really saw an opportunity. One of the great presidents here, Pepe Figueres, he abolished the military. He took a lot of that money, put it into education, put it into quality of life. It's why the average lifespan in Costa Rica is over 80 years. It's why, you know, the Happy Place Index in 2012 rated it the happiest country to live in in the world. And what a coincidence. They also have over 30 percent of their land protected, whether it's national parks or land trusts. So all that nature, all that clean air, all that being outside and being in wild places, it's not just good for the animals, but it's also good for us and it's good for the economy. So Costa Rica has proven that, you know, their nature is worth more alive. Wildlife tourism and ecotourism is one of the biggest economies that they have. It's either one or two after coffee, after agriculture. So they've really like kind of proven this model of conservation to be beneficial for the land, for the people for nature and for the economy. So when you have all those things working in your benefit as filmmakers, you get to like cherry pick, like, okay, who's doing what? And then we get to reward great behavior. That's why it's worth mentioning for this film, we didn't stay at a single chain resort. We stayed at locally owned and operated places, places like Brian just mentioned, you meet somebody, you're nice, you show enthusiasm, they invite you to their backyard. You know, it's, it's a little bit different in the States where it's like, oh, don't talk to strangers. Here, it's like, talk to strangers. And if they're excited about wildlife, show them your backyard. So they've really used it to their benefit to preserve nature. And so you'd say this is a uniquely Costa Rican story. And by what I understand, listening to all y'all stories is that in Costa Rica, the environment really dictates the culture. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they really, they really are very passionate about, passionate about protecting it. And even so, like, I've taken several drives with people that have lived here for four or five decades. And they'll tell me like, see all this area right here. This all used to just be one big farm, and we'll, we'll be driving for three hours and you wouldn't see a tree. Now there's nothing but forest in that area. Like, and they're very, they take a lot of pride in it and, and um, they continue to carry the torch in that as well. Yeah, it's pretty, really cool. Super cool. We should also note that our narrator is a, was born in Costa Rica, Harry Sean yeah. Jr. So right. that was- people are all in Costa Rica. That's excellent. Yeah. So we were talking about the the density, the biodensity in Costa Rica, and it's home to over half a million species. And I know you were discussing this before and you you touched on it before, but what really drew you guys to hummingbirds? 
What's not to and, love? And it's the hummingbird. <laughs> yeah. What's not to love? You know, this <laughs> is, you know, uh, hummingbirds were, uh, my first hummingbird film was a fantastic breakthrough in my career. So I have a very warm place in my heart for hummingbirds. Um, and that film that my first hummingbird film was probably mostly out of focus. You know, the Phantom <laughs> had just uh, had just come out. Uh, it was clunky. It had you had to operate it from a laptop. It was, uh, you know, it was just the early days of that camera. And but we were so happy to have anything in slow motion. It was like, oh, it looks great. You know, and we laugh about it now. So I think that you hummingbirds are super easy to relatively, I should say, easy to work with. And, you know, their behavior is fascinating the way they fly. People are endlessly fascinated with how they fly. And then there's all these great stories to tell about them. You know, when you look at a species versus taking like a lion, a film about a lion, if you take a, a film that's about a family, you can investigate all the different parts of the family that show how diverse that they are. And so that gives the viewer like a sense of like, wow, this is really rich. There's all these different behaviors through this one family versus just showing one behavior that like a lion or an elephant does. And I think that that uh, sort of taxonomic or family approach to, to films is really fun. And uh, you know you can do it with all kinds of things. And it allows you to have a lot of bows in your quiver and you can just, you take the viewer on a, on a little bit of a, of a ride that they don't know what's gonna come next, right? It's like, oh my God, now they do this? you're kidding me I thought they just did the, they were just in this one lane but you can show all the different lanes that evolution has given to the family and all the different ways that the family has evolved and sort of subtly talk about bigger science stories but not have to you know get too sciencey you let the birds do the work for you and I think those kinds of films for me are really fun and really gratifying to make and so you had discussed that before you were filming on a phantom what is the frame rate that you was, you were using? Because it is just, I was watching it and I could not, because I've seen hummingbirds move so fast. Yeah. So, and like, how did you catch the actual beats? Yeah, all different ranges. I think Philippe, uh, and who also operates a phantom, we've everything from 999 frames a second down to, you know, 240, depending. Like the bigger ones, you can go a little bit lower. You can go shoot at 240, bigger meaning only you know, this big. But the little tiny ones, like the volcano hummingbird, which is teeny tiny, you really have to be up at 900 to slow that little slow that little bird down. You can yeah. actually hear the difference in in them whenever they're flying next to you. Like one is the volcano is just like it's just a fast vibrating sound is coming whipping by your ear, and the other ones are still like just a little bit different pitched. Like it's um, it's interesting when they're whenever they're flying really quickly next to you. And the other thing, too, is everybody thinks about frame rates when it comes to birds. But when you're working in a place like Costa Rica, which is mostly jungle, rainforest, cloud forest, you got to have low light abilities. So when you're following say. something like the sickle bill deep into the forest where it's difficult to walk, it's difficult to navigate, you know, think about sunlight trying to penetrate the forest floor. It's pretty, pretty challenging. So I'd say at this point, me and my Red Gemini are Facebook official. I probably spent more time with that camera than any human being on the planet. So being able to film, whether it's in 5K or four and a half or 4K at 120, but then shoot clean at like up to 12,000, that was an absolute game breaker for this film because with almost any other camera, you're going to have to compromise the frame rates and drop down just to get the exposure. But low light was the name of the game in this film. Like you'll see a lot of the shots their sharp contrast, like when I was filming the Sickleville nest, for example, there was no light hitting the nest because they nest in this very particular way where they take spider webs, they wrap it around moss and they enclose a leaf. So there's, you know, it's kind of a secret spot. So no light was hitting it, but in the background, light was hitting trees and it was making it completely overexposed. So you have a lot of like super challenging moments as a filmmaker, especially for hummingbirds in particular in the forest. So we had to have an onslaught of gear, but low light, high speed, those two things were the name of the game. I was going to ask if you brought lights, because I swear it seemed like they were like perfectly lit. <laughs> of course. If we could, if we can light them, we will. 
That's what I was saying. I was like, they have to have lights. They have to have lights. But then I understand the Gemini. Meant for lights. They're iridescent. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. Light, yes. And, and they change the oil. Fruit, depending on where the light is coming from. So and they take the oil from the the gland that's like above their tail to make them glisten. Like what a joy to film. Yeah, so that actually. Really that actually brings me to my next question. So where I come from in the American South, whenever we come back from any adventure, we always talked about the peaches and the pits and the peach being our favorite part and the pit being the opposite. <laughs> so what are y'all's peaches and pits? Huh. Well, my peaches are, my peaches would be like the diversity uh, in Costa Rica and just being in the wild places of Costa Rica. I think Doug talked about that, how wild it is. And you don't think it's going to be that wild. And you can get out there and there are no people. The pits would be how many times I had to, I might, I had flat tires. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> because once, I mean, Costa Rica is a developed country. It has great roads. But once you get off those roads, oh, dear Lord. So I probably had six or seven flat tires. But Costa Ricans being Costa Ricans, super friendly, super helpful. You know, we had people stop and help us and drive us. 40 minutes into town and, you know, help us find a tire that matched and bring it back to our car and help us put it on. Um, Cause Doug and I, we blew out two tires in like 40 minutes. At once. <laughs> <laughs> One the night before. And they were like, Oh, we can get that fixed in town. And on the way into town, I was like, gug, 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 again, and I'm not a crazy driver. It's just, it was, it was rough going. So yeah, I think that uh, having to get hauled out by a tractor one day. So yeah, that, that would be the pit. <laughs> Peach for me was going to, well, the whole thing was great. I mean, just to be introduced to a country this way and go there all over the place to all these environments, but to go to the Osa Peninsula, which is the wildest, most beautiful place, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Um, Philippe and I were there for about a week filming Scarlet Macaws and a bunch of other things in Corcovado National Park, monkeys, and I mean, tapirs, you name it, we were filming it. And uh it just felt, it was one of those moments where you just feel like this is, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that this is my job. <laughs> I don't know if I had any pits, honestly. <laughs> I gotta say, this is a pretty good one. What about you guys? And what about you? Each is just not having to physically travel like in an airplane away. That was, it's nice being located in Costa Rica and not having to you can just get in your car and go um in the pit yeah I mean, there's not really bad pits i mean it takes a long time to drive because the roads are really windy but that just means you get to enjoy the scenery so it's not really a pit <laughs> girl you want to talk about peaches i got a whole bushel of them what do you want to hear like, <laughs> i mean i could spend all day talking about like my favorite moments and and the stumble upon experiences uh, to name a few, you know, when Doug and I were filming Scarlet Macaws, I, I spent like almost two weeks previously before the shoot looking exactly where to film Scarlet Macaws because I wanted eye level shots of them flying. And we found this closed down hotel that this wealthy guy bought, turned it into like his vacation getaway. We were filming Scarlet Macaws eye level. He let us film up on his balcony and then they bring us out margaritas and then uh, the local who was a musician started serenading us from the bathroom because it had great acoustics. So here we are filming Scarlet Macaws eye level, mating in a tree with the ocean in the background, getting sang to. It's like, you know, where else can you have that experience? It's not exactly up on Yelp. I don't think any, I don't think any, uh, you know, operator offers that yet. Um, and then there's things like it was a crazy me, peach. <laughs> was that was a one crazy, of the crazy peach. peaches I've ever yeah, had. no, no, no peach in that pit, honey. Um, <laughs> no peach, peach pear in that <laughs> pit. <laughs> and then uh, one of the other ones for me personally was capturing uh, the resplendent Quetzal's nesting. So that's a story that you know Brian and I have been visiting for close to seven years now. It's incredibly difficult to see the chick because a lot of times they'll lose the chick you know, during uh, the incubation process or, you know, predation. And so seeing the actual chick head pop out, it took about seven years to be able to get that. So this last year, I actually got to film it for my birthday. I saw the resplendent Quetzal chick for the first time. So filming that nesting sequence on my birthday and then 
unfortunately, um, all the other chicks in the area died last year, but luckily the year before, Ryan and I went and covered it at about four different nests. So we had that footage already in the can that we could kind of like make this sequence out of. But it's it's honestly, I always say this, like you come to Costa Rica for the wildlife, but you stay for the people. They're incredibly heartwarming. They're incredibly receptive and they're super prideful of what they have. And more importantly, they want to share it because they want to preserve it. So the only pit is really like the end of production. It's not being able to like be laser focused on hummingbirds and going around and exploring new avenues. And as I mentioned before, hummingbirds are the messengers of the forest. They'll take you to such unique places. And so now we just kind of have to redirect and look at other animals to show us Costa Rica. But that was the hardest part was ending production. Well, that sounded like a great birthday present to get those shots. For sure. For sure. That's an incredible bird, too. I love that whole sequence. Ashley, Another thing that people won't no expect pit. to see. What's that? Yeah, it just said it's all peach, no pit. All peach, yeah, no pit. All peach. I was going to say, uh, when you were talking about the glittery feathers, that was just like, that sounds like a big old peach. But <laughs> so, so I know a lot of people and there's a lot of people watching this that are interested in becoming wildlife filmmakers. If y'all had one piece of advice to give to people, what would it be? And that's a big one. It's a big one to the, yeah. boil it down to one piece of advice. Just get I, out would, and I would say, I would say, don't give up. You know, yeah. if you if you know, if I look back on how hard it was to start to be in this career, I might have been daunted. But if you just keep yourself focused and narrow uh, and keep your eyes on the prize and you really love animals and that's what you want to do, just keep at it. Just keep I at agree. it. I agree. Everyone else? I agree. I think there's a lot of people who like the idea of filmmaking and then when they realize all of the logistics and planning that so much of it doesn't have anything to do with the fun part I, I think those people kind of fall away and then there are people who just want to do it no matter what and I think yeah like Anne said I would just say just do it do what you can to to make something and just keep trying it and I think the people who are really passionate and motivated to do it do that and end up like all of us I would say first first things first is you just have to get out there and start shooting something for yourself, whether it's with your, if you have a phone, everyone's got a phone. If you have a DSLR or red, it doesn't matter. Just get out there and start doing it. And secondly, find a mentor or someone who's already doing it. And for lack of a better term, annoy the hell out of them and like hit them up and tell them you'll do anything for free for however long and just, just to get your, your, your foot in the door. And yeah, just those two things. But they're not yeah. going to trust you if you don't have anything of that's to show them or that to show them that you're actually really interested in it because it's not an easy thing. Um, you you have to put in a lot of time, a lot of hours. You're, it's not easy to find these species or just to be out into the woods. It's uncomfortable situations, so they have to know that you're you're actually committed and into it. I was going to say phones these days. You can get so much from them, so much. Like look, we got like the three. The three lenses, like yeah, come you on. got three different lenses in one. Look at that. Right. I know, exactly. Well, Philippe, what's your piece of advice? So, if anybody who's watching this, if you want to get, and I'm talking to you at this point, if you're watching this and you on the other side of that, you human being, not like Instagram bot, um, if you want to get into wildlife filmmaking, the absolute number one thing that you can possibly do is not wait for somebody to give you permission. So like everybody else just mentioned, there's a reason that everybody pretty much had the same exact exact message. It's get started. Don't wait for somebody to tell you you can or can't do this because right now there's zero excuses. Like, you know, I started my production company with my best friend who's on this, Brian Magari. We had zero backing, zero funds. I grew up as an illegal immigrant, you know, in the United States for 20 years, raised by a single mother in poverty. We started a company with no means. We bought a van, converted it into a camper, put a ton of equipment around inside that thing and traveled around the country and annoyed people until we got chances. So what I'm getting at is if we can do it, then you can do it. Because right now, it's not just the, the best time 
to be a wildlife filmmaker because there's so many different avenues in which you can broadcast your stories, but it's the most important time to be a wildlife filmmaker. The world is really crumbling down around us when we think about natural spaces, about wild habitats, about creatures. You know, you think about a place like Costa Rica, for example, as we mentioned before, there's around half a million different species. It's 130,000 kilometers, roughly the size of West Virginia, and has about 5% of the Earth's biodiversity. Yet most of those species are either endangered or critically endangered. 900 of those species are birds. You know, so if you want to get started, start with birds because they're easy, but ultimately just start. Don't wait for somebody to give you permission. And if you work hard and if you start to emulate the things that you like based off of what you see, but then throw your own little seasoning on there, you know, instead of salt bay, you can just be conservation bay. Just sprinkle your editing touch, sprinkle your vision, sprinkle your narration, your storytelling, your personal story. Just get started, work hard, and don't stop. My favorite photographer in the world is Michael Nick Nichols, and he became famous for photographing Jane Goodall in Tanzania when she was doing the heat of her research, and it took him almost 10 years to get accepted by National Geographic. What if he quit after nine? He wouldn't have become, you know, the best wildlife photographer in the world at some point. So don't stop. Don't quit. It's more important now than ever to tell these stories. And eventually somebody will pay you to do this. And it'll be the greatest life story you could ever sink your teeth into. That is amazing. Amazing advice to everyone watching. Uh, is there anything else y'all want to add? Watch the hummingbird effect on PBS. Oh. I was just going to say. <laughs> well, I could just talk to y'all all day, but I'm sure y'all have lots to do with this film coming out today. So I'll have to let y'all go. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today. And it was just so fascinating to learn all that it takes to make such a unique and downright gorgeous film. So to everyone watching, thank you so much. And make sure you catch the hummingbird effect on PBS Nature. Bye, y'all. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.